Hey everybody, welcome back to GR Research where we are again doing speaker upgrades. And this time we've stepped things up a little bit to a little more expensive mini monitor. This is the Dynaudio Special 40 or as it's often called the Anniversary 40. And as you can see, it has a beautiful cabinet. Um, it looks like the whole thing's made out of stacked Baltic birch or something, but it's not. It's an MDF cabinet, and this is a laminate that they put over it that gives it this look. And beautifully red dyed and very high gloss finish. It is really pretty. And, of course, the Dyn Audio drivers that everybody seems to hoo-hoo over. We'll see if that's worthy of a woo-woo. And... Let's take a look at how this thing measured. I first took some on-axis measurements on it. It's within plus or minus a couple of dB, so you'd think, oh, good, nice and smooth, but no, no, not quite. Um, if you look at the frequency response, you'll see a little bit of a crest there at about 1100 hertz, a little bit of a peak there. And if we look at the spectral decay, you'll see it's more than just a little crest or peak. There's some stored energy there in this little woofer. And it, it's carrying on quite a bit. Also visited the um, review that Stereofile did on these a couple years ago, back in August of 2018. John Atkinson did a review on these and his measurements looked almost exactly like mine. His was very, very similar. And he noted he was bothered by the woofer's response at just above 1k hertz yeah i'd be bothered by that too that's that's gonna make things a little tough to listen to that's gonna be a little bit of a ring right there so i took um later i took these things apart and just measured the individual drivers and let's just skip ahead to the individual measurements of just the woofer by itself and yeah that that's rough that doesn't look like what you would expect the response of any driver it is um let me put my glasses on here so i can get a good look at it it's got the big peak going on at 1100 hertz it's got another big peak at about 3400 hertz and it's got another peak at 10k hertz so this thing is just riddled with peaks it it's rough um of course, this is the, one of their darling little drivers. It's got the three inch diameter voice coil, the neodymium magnet, the huge vented pole piece, and of course this uh, poly cone. It's a polypropylene type cone. Neat looking frame, uh, but uh, no, that, that driver doesn't measure really well. And funny, you'd think you'd get a little more than that at this point price point because these listed according to the one of the reviews I looked at was two thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars funny I've done a bunch of reviews or reviews I've done some upgrades on some inexpensive speakers lately which included the little Sony CS5 where the upgrade kit cost almost twice as much as the speaker because they blow those speakers out for nothing I mean nothing uh, I've seen them one hundred eighteen dollars and uh, for the pair and so the speaker and the upgrade was like four hundred and five dollars roughly and i heard a lot of guys saying oh man i wouldn't spend that much on an upgrade for that speaker that's almost twice what the speaker costs that's not worth it i'd spend the money on a higher quality speaker or a better speaker you mean like three thousand dollars for this speaker let's look inside of this little speaker I've got the uh, the damping material here, or the absorbing material, lifted up a little so you can see inside. At least it has some iron core inductors. The capacitors are a mix between very expense, very inexpensive poly caps and a bunch of electrolytic caps. The resistors are almost all sand cast except for one. So what did you get for $3,000? Did you get a woofer that measures really smooth? No. Did you get higher quality crossover parts? No. Um, 
You got a beautiful cabinet though. That's for sure. You got a beautiful cabinet. But did you get this level of parts? Did you get large air core inductors, all poly caps, sonic caps, two connectors, high quality wire? No, no, none of that. The wiring that was in this thing, um, the inexpensive type wire um, with push on style connectors. And this is your common like 16 gauge wire, heavy PVC coating, boo, no PVC and 10 style push on connectors. So no, you didn't get more speaker as you spent more money in those price points, especially in the mass produced speakers, you're still buying the same level of quality of parts that you're gonna see across the board. I'm not seeing a really high quality level of parts in a lot of these speakers, at least not anywhere near the level of what the kit is that I'm offering. So. Let's finish looking at the measurements of the factory speaker. And let's look at the vertical off axis, which is not bad. As we move up vertically, we see a little bit of a dipped area through the crossover region, but not bad. Um, the horizontal off axis, it's a little lumpy, but also not bad. Uh, the impedance measurement shows that it dips to about four and a half ohms, and there's a little resonance there. Um, Right before 20 hertz, there's a little bit of a resonance, but overall, pretty smooth impedance. I noticed in the review that John Atkinson did there at Stereophile, he, he goes a little further than I do on some things. He attaches accelerometers on different parts of the cabinet and measures cabinet wall resonances. And he noticed quite a bit on this one. Uh, to me, it seems like a fairly well-built box. There's one brace running through it here, but whatever the material is that they're, they're using does have a little bit of a ring to it and it really showed up on his measurements. So it's definitely another speaker that would benefit a lot from lining it with some no res. So what the heck was I able to do with this thing? Let's look at some new measurements and let's just start with um, the crossover measurement here. What I did was to get this woofer down and, and its output where those peaks were, I had to cross it lower. In other words, just don't let the thing get up into ranges where it's gonna start squawking. And if you look at the frequency response of just the woofer only with the new crossover on it, you notice I brought the level down in that 1K hertz to 1.1K hertz region. You can see the knee there, but I brought it down and knocked a bunch of that out of it. So what I'm doing is just pulling it back a lot sooner, not letting it play up so high so that you hear that ringing. And the overall response is now much smoother. It's more balanced from end to end. It's within plus or minus a dB and a half from one end to the other, maybe even a little smoother. And let's look at that spectral decay now. If you look at the spectral decay, you'll see there's still just a little bit there, but I've knocked most of it out. I mean, most of it's, psh. if you look at the before and after, of the spectral decays, you'll see it's a lot smoother and we really knocked that down out of it. So a lot, it's gonna be a lot easier to listen to. Now let's look at the vertical off axis. You notice now the vertical off axis is much smoother. It's, it's, it, their drivers are now in phase over a wide range. So you can go up or down and they're not becoming out of phase with each other because of the time domain, time delay shift between one or the other as you go up or down. And most of that is because I pushed that crossover so much lower that it's down there where the wavelengths are longer. And I still did it fairly steeply to control the tweeter. The tweeter's fairly robust and it would play down that low. So it wasn't hard to allow the tweeter to play down that low. It did need a little bit of a notch filter because it tended to want to TP up in the middle. So I had to pull that down out of it and work with the balance from end to end to get that nice, nice smooth balance. Now, horizontal off axis, we see a little bit of a peaked area at 3K Hertz as you start moving off axis versus the on axis. Um, but it's still not too bad. And if you look at the impedance response, you'll see it's, it's more balanced now than it was from end to end. It still dips to about four and a half ohms. So still about the same load that it was um, if you look at 
This is an interesting one. I took a measurement of the woofer and the tweeter, no crossover. So you can see the measurements of each driver and you can see it's they're not real smooth. If you look at the tweeter's response, it's a lot hotter up top and then it drops down and then it carries out for a little further then it drops down again. So I had to configure a network that balanced out the top with the bottom and allowed that thing to roll off and protect it enough. So it was a little tricky. Um, if you look at this measurement, you'll see the same measurement, tweeter, no crossover, woofer, no crossover, and then right across below it there, you'll see the measurement that I was able to attain with this thing with the crossover that I put on it, which I'm amazed that I was able to get it that smooth with drivers that measure that rough. Um, tweeter, not so bad, but woofer, woofer is a mess. So, not only did I design something new that corrected some of the issues, maintained a better response vertically and horizontally, or at least vertically a lot better response, horizontally, eh, fair. The next big thing, and this is the, where the, a lot of the huge improvement comes in, is the quality of the parts. And on the woofer, at least, we went okay on the woofer. We've got a large air core inductor and a poly cap with just one resistor, not a sand kiss resistor. On the tweeter, we are able to do second order with one resistor at the front and an L-pad at the back. And we did one little notch filter right there in the circuit to um, smooth out that overall response and rebalance it. Actually, the, it's, it's an inline notch filter. It's not, in line, it's not in shunt. It's inline and it's at the front of the circuit. So we're rebalancing the shape of the tweeter and then we're adding the network on it to knock it down at the bottom. So that, that worked out pretty well. Uh, sonic caps in both positions. So cap quality went up a lot. Clarity detail is gonna be up a lot. Um, tube connectors also are gonna make a nice improvement. The binding posts that it had on it were brass and they were reasonable. Uh, they did not have a steel screw on the other side of it like we see in some of the budget line. They spent an extra 10 cents and got a brass screw to put on the other side of it to hold it on. So we didn't have ferrule magnetic parts in the signal path like we see in some of the budget models. But again, not expensive to uh, change that. And the tube connectors, which are all copper, that's gonna improve that connectivity and the signal transfer quite a bit and the clarity. So um, new wiring, again, high quality wire, solder, and I'll throw in some heat shrink. The parts total came to 245, and I'm going to throw in a sheet of no res with it to fix the little resonances of the cabinet. You're looking at 295 to fix this thing and to bring it up to a much higher level. So this one, it's going to be hard for you guys to complain about and say, "Man, that's more than the speaker cost," because the speaker cost three thousand dollars. So for an extra less than $300, you can turn this into a pretty nice sounding little speaker. This fixes the issues that Dyn Audio did not address or did not fix and should give you your money's worth if you spent money on these to begin with. This will make them sing. That's it for this week. Um, we got more speaker upgrades just right behind these as fast as I can get them videoed and done. So more stuff is coming. I haven't forgot the cable stuff. We've got videos we're going to do on that. We're going to have some fun with that stuff. So hang on and hit the subscribe button. we got to get those subscriptions up a little bit. We appreciate that. And we'll see you guys next week.